Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you are good and good all the time. God, we thank you for life and life more abundantly. We thank you for joy unspeakable and full of glory. God, we thank you tonight for a peace that passeth all human understanding. And we thank you that you fight our battles even when we stand still. God, tonight would you speak to our heart, our minds, our emotion, our intellect. We want to see you high and lifted up. And we ask that your name be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name we do pray. And all God's people said together, amen. How many of y'all are glad to be in the house of God tonight? Amen. How many of y'all are glad that God is sa has saved us and we have been learning about the heavenly sanctuary? We've had a great week so far. We've had a powerful week. Um, on Sabbath, we talked about how the Lord is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, how he intercedes for us on our behalf. Saturday evening, we discuss the importance of taking time in the morning to talk with the Lord. Uh, that on the other side of your bedroom door, when you leave your house, the devil is trying to take you out. Uh, but you can never trust in your own strength, in your own direction. You must trust in the direction of Almighty God. Come on and say amen. amen. And then on Sunday evening, we discuss the importance of the Word of God, that the Word of God, um, in Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra the priest goes and he preaches the Word even after they have built. We talked about their desire for the Word of God even in the regular moments of life. And then on Monday uh, afternoon, sorry, yeah, Monday afternoon, we talked about the importance of the outer court. Last night, we talked about the power of reconciliation between church members. And so we've been having a powerful uh, week here at Camp Meeting 2024, Salvation Simplified. And tonight I want to call your prayerful attention to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter 24. And while you're turning there, allow me to uh, thank your pastor, Pastor Akali, for the invitation. And I'm, I'm blessed to be here tonight uh, and this entire week. And then it is a joy to see a colleague from the United States, Pastor Derek Lane, uh, he was preaching a camp meeting somewhere else last week and decided to stay over. Stand up, Pastor, and let the individual see. Pastor's in Seattle, Washington. And so he came. He said he's heard so many great things about new life. And so he had to come over and spend a day at new life. So let's say amen for him. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 24. When you found it, would you stand to your feet as we honor the word of the Lord? I'm reading today. Uh, I'm going to pick it up at verse 10, but let me give you a little context here. Um, Abraham is getting old. Abraham is getting old and he is looking for a wife for his son Isaac. And he decides to send his, um, his oldest servant who scholars believe is Eleazar. Eleazar is his first servant that he got from Egypt. He, he, he decides to send the servant to go and find a wife for Isaac. And this is where we pick up the story in verse 10. I'm reading from the New International Version. Here's what the Bible says. Then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. And he set out for Aram Naharim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening. 
the time the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar, that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished, someone shout, before he had finished. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jaw on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. I want to today to anchor into verse 12 today, that, that, first, uh, that, 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 that first part of uh, verse 12. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. I, I want to preach for the next few moments, God will make you successful. Turn to your, turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor, neighbor, God will make you successful. God will make you successful. Turn to your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, other neighbor. oh, other neighbor. other neighbor, God will make me successful. Me successful. Type self in the chest, say, self, oh, self. self, come on, say it louder, self, self. Oh self. oh self, the God I serve, come on, the God I serve, will make me successful. One more time, God will make me successful. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Mafanikio, God will make me successful. Successful, successful. God will make me successful. I have lived long enough now to know that when you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. In fact, God supernaturally handles things for you that you could never handle for yourself. And so for the matriarchs and the patriarchs in Genesis, their life was not about adhering to later established rituals. No, it, it, it was about this relationship with God, this genesis of a relationship with God who they were coming to know as actively involved in their lives. That they were coming to know a great Jehovah who would guide them as they pilgrim through barren lands. This is seen in the story of Abraham, particularly when he seeks a wife for his son, Isaac. And here, close to the middle of the book of Genesis, we see a servant who we believe to be Eleazar. Eleazar, Isaac's oldest staff member, is sent to seek a bride for his master's son. What an outstanding responsibility. What enormity of trust that his leader is trusting him with not just finding a spouse, but to find a person that would be pivotal and influential and necessary in the continuation of the divinely promised legacy. And, and, and what arrested my attention, Pastor Akali, out of this chapter, what jumped out at me, what made my spirit leap was this one singular verse in which the servant, while he is progressing somebody else's request, whilst he is building somebody else's home, while he is furthering somebody else's dream, he does not treat it lightly. He does not treat it as a fool's errand. He does not think it's a waste of time, but 
He takes his role so seriously, even though it's on behalf of someone else, he takes it so seriously that he takes the time to ask God for success. He, he, he asks God for success while being a blessing to somebody else. And in this ancient narrative, we see a reflection of our own sojourn marked by moments of doubt and decisions of faith. And just as the servant embarked on a mission not knowing where it would lead, but trusting the Lord's direction, we too are called to step out in faith, trusting in the God who, who has authored not just the book of Genesis, but the God who has authored our very existence. And, and I believe wholeheartedly, and this really is the message summed up in one sentence, I believe wholeheartedly that God has what we need to make our endeavors a success. Do we have a witness here? And quite often in the dance of life's decisions, we often find ourselves poised between two tectonic discordant plates, the stillness of prayerful waiting on this side and the motion of active seeking on this side. And this delicate balance is vividly portrayed in the journey of Abraham's servant in Genesis 24, tasked with a mission of profound importance, finding a wife for Isaac. You, 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 you have to understand that this servant, he stands as a beacon of wisdom for us because before taking a single step, he seeks guidance from the Lord. Can I tell you something tonight? You will never be successful in your life if you do not surround yourself with wisdom. You know, you know th th this servant, his faith is not a passive one. Prayer does not stop him from stepping. It propels him forward. And so with each step toward Mesopotamia, he embodies a trust in God's plan that is active, not idle. And, and I think all of us need to take a lesson from his book that faith without works is dead. Do I have a witness here? You have to learn how to put your faith in motion. Faith does not cause you to come and sit still and say, we shall not be moved. But faith says, Lord, in any way you want to use me, I'll be happy to be used by the Lord. Come on and say amen. And so he, he prepares and he plans and he moves all while his heart remains anchored in a state of waiting for God's sign. So here's the question today. How can we balance prayerful waiting with active seeking in our decision making? Because some of us lean heavy on pray and do nothing. Others of us lean heavy on doing something but never asking God if we're doing the right thing. And, and what we see in this text is this perfect blend that I think is important for us. And so firstly, uh, in, in the pursuit of success, uh, firstly, uh, we see that we must handle strange requests. Someone shout, handle strange requests. Sarah, Sarah has died and Sarah has been buried and Abraham uh, her widow now uh, senses his own mortality. He senses his own mortality because he knows that because of sin he will not live forever. And before he, before he passes away, he has a responsibility to find his son a wife. Not just any woman but he has the responsibility to find his son a good woman. Someone shout, a good woman. Now, now this is a strange request because Abraham makes his servant 
swear an oath to him that he will find his son a wife. And there's this nuance that Abraham trusted the servant enough to give him this assignment. I, I've lived long enough to know new life that you cannot trust everybody with your requests. I, I've learned to only request people, request things of people whom I trust. I've seen marriages fail because of no trust. Friendships have been dissipated because of no trust. I've seen jobs lost because of no trust. Business partnerships have been divided because of no trust. Personal growth is hindered because of no trust. Can I tell you something? I, I, I know you want to be popular, but in in this life, you will only have a few people you can trust. Come on and say amen. I, I, I have 5,000 friends on my Facebook account, but if ever I get in trouble, I don't have 5,000 people I can call. I can only call about five of them. If I scroll through my Instagram account, I can only call about five or six people who I trust because even though they are your friend on social media doesn't mean they're a true friend in real life. In fact, I have a definition of friendship. Here's my definition of friendship. A friend will defend you in your absence. A friend will promote you in your absence. And a friend will tell you the truth to your face. And if your so-called friend doesn't do those three things, you can, you can bet your bottom shilling that they are not your friend. Do I have a witness here? Friend, a friend, he, he, he trusts Eleazar. He trusts Eleazar. Listen to this. Because Eleazar, the servant, has never tried to usurp Abraham's authority. Now, now this is important because Eleazar has been with him since before Isaac was born. In fact, if you read through the account of Genesis, when Abraham is getting frustrated with God, he says, God is my servant Eleazar actually going to be the inheritor of the promise. People were thinking that Eleazar was going to inherit all that Abraham had. Maybe Eleazar thought that he would inherit all that Abraham had. And no, but Eleazar never tries to usurp Abraham's authority. Understand there is a level of trust between the two of them. Abraham gives this taxonomy of a strange request. He says, look, I, I've got this covenantal promise from God. And he says, I need you to go find a wife for my son, but do not get a Canaanite woman. Get a wife from my own people. That there were some things going on in Canaan that Abraham did not want as a part of the family. Eleazar, I can imagine Eleazar probably asking Abraham, why, why can't Isaac go find a wife for himself? And, 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 I, and I hear, I can sense Abraham saying, I, I know my son. If he goes over there, he may be tempted to stay over there. And God says, we are to stay right here. Can I tell you something? If you want success from the Lord, you better be where God wants you to be. And so, and so, and so Abraham makes it plain. Isaac isn't going. Um, so he says, to Eleazar go. And if you read earlier in, the, in that chapter that we read, Abraham, watch this, this is beautiful. Abraham says to Eleazar, you go and angels will go before you. Let me try that one more time. That's a great place to say amen. He says, angels will go before you. Amen. Try it one more time. He says, you go and angels will go before you. Now, this is not to be overlooked because these are the last recorded words 
of Abraham. He says, angels will go before you because God is involved. And I, and I know we, in 2024, people don't think angels are real. But can I tell you something? You don't have to manipul manipulate your way through life because God is getting ready to open the door for you. You don't have to lie your way through life. Angels have already prepared the way for you. Can I tell you that God sends, Spirit of Prophecy says that God sends to each of us a guardian angel. Come on and say amen. Angels are keeping watch over us. In fact, there's an old song that says, all night, all day, I got angels watching over me. So, so there's this strange request, and, and, and part of the reason, Pastor Lane, why it's a strange request is because it shows us that God doesn't just work by rearranging molecules. It shows us that God doesn't just work by making the sun stand still. It shows us that God doesn't just work by healing the sick and raising the dead. There are far more times that God operates in the sphere of the normal. So if you are a miracle junkie, and you think God only works in the flash, you'll miss the manifold daily moves of God in the ordinary. Every step I take, it is ordinary, but it's God, hallelujah. Every time I breathe, it is ordinary, but it is God. Every time that paycheck hits my account, it is ordinary, but it is God. Every time you arrive at your destination, it is ordinary, but it is God. Every time you are not putting socks on your hands and gloves on your feet, it is ordinary, but it is God. And I'm not saying that God is ordinary, but what I am saying is that God is as strong in his miraculous moments as he is in ordinary moments. Do I have a witness here? And so God brings, God brings uh, Abraham's son Isaac, a wife, through normal events of life. And sometimes strange requests, strange moments, mysterious stuff often opens the door for God to do something we've never seen God do before. And, 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 I, and I think we are all living in strange times. E even here in this place, there are tensions that have been seen due to social and uh, economic differences between different cultures and different ethnic groups and, and, and these situations arise during elections and political conflicts where one group feels they are favored and another group feels left behind and it leads to conflict in society. But I believe based upon the word of God that red, yellow, black or white, tall or short, fat or thin, rich or poor, or in the middle, young or old, Luo or Kikuyu from the city or from the village, all are precious in the sight of God. Do I have a witness here? So there's this strange request, and it leads, let me turn the diamond some more, it leads to a sincere supplication. Someone shout sincere, sincere supplication. Look, look, look at the text. Um, the servant, this faithful servant, uh, he takes with him, verse 10, he takes with him 10 camels. Not his camels. He don't own any camels. He's a servant. He loads the camels with good gifts and good things, not his gifts and good things. It's his master's gifts and good things. And he makes this, 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 this. He makes this uh, 800 kilometer journey to his destination. Uh, 
it's like he, he travels from Nairobi to Mombasa and back, and that's one way for him. He makes this 800 kilometer journey from the region of Canaan to where he is going. There is no cars. There is no Uber. He has two options. He can either walk or he can ride a camel hub. So he makes this long journey and, and as he gets to the place where the camels can have a water break, verse 11, he whispers a prayer in the evening. Hallelujah. And it just so happens that when he prays, Pastor Akali, it is the time that the women go out to draw water. Now, now, now here it is. Here's what he prays. He prays, Lord, give me success today. Now, can I tell you something, New Life? The prayer of success realizes that I can only do so much. I can only take it so far. I can only take it so high. But at some point, if I'm going to make it to the next level in my journey, I need Jehovah to do what I cannot do. And it is only Jehovah that can make the metaphorical eight hundred kilometer journey you have traveled it is only Jehovah that can ensure that all your labor all your tears all the time you spent shall not be in vain he, he, he prays at the time the women go out to draw water now here's what's crazy new life an hour earlier would have been too soon an hour later would have been too late. But when angels go before you, I said when angels go before you, I said when angels go before you, you will be at the right place at the right time to receive a blessing from the Lord. And so he sincerely asked God for something that heretofore I have never paid attention to. I've never paid attention to this. He, look at it, look at it. He asks God for success today. In all my years reading the Bible, I've never paid attention to the fact that the servant asked God in verse 12 for success, he says, grant me success today, not tomorrow, not next year, not, 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 not next month, but God, I need a miracle today. Paul planted Apollos watered, but, only, but, but it is only God that can give increase today. He asks God for success to complete the assignment. And the problem with a whole lot of us is that we start something that we are unable to finish. Because, Pastor Lane, uh, running the race is good. Uh, keeping the faith is good. But it means nothing if you don't finish the course. And what discombobulated me was that this was not success for him. This was not going to bless him. This was not going to benefit him. He sought success in the service of somebody else. The fact that he asked success shows that he understands the magnitude of his assignment. Now you have to be careful. You have to be careful how you treat people whom God has assigned to lead you. I've seen people die who tried to talk bad about the leader. 
I've seen people go bankrupt who tried to talk bad about the leader. But, 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 and, I, and I've realized, you've got, you got to treat your leaders well. But I've also realized in my own ministry that leaders must be careful how they treat people around them. Because the leaders, while we may be the face, we are not the only force. And the leader, Abraham, Abraham could not travel. He was too old. He needed Eleazar. And just because Eleazar, just because the servant was considered lower, it does not mean he was lesser in the sight of God. So, so the servant in Genesis 24 prays sincerely for success today. And his sincere supplication leads to practice, some practical, some, some strategic steps. Someone shout strategic steps. Now, this, this is biblical because one, one of the things we don't understand sometimes in our church is that if we want to be successful in certain areas and accomplish certain things, we have to do it with a strategy. Success does, does, doesn't just happen. There, there, there's got to be a strategy. And those of you that work in corporate, legal, business, city, county, education, music, healthcare, uh, banking, any kind of area, you understand that strategy is crucial for success. The, the journey of Abraham's servant in Genesis 24, where he seeks a wife for Isaac, can be likened to a well-known strategy model. Um, I, I don't know if you, you, you've heard of it over here, uh, but it's called SMART goals. Someone say SMART goals. How many of y'all have heard of SMART goals? Raise your hand if you've heard of SMART. Okay, a few people have heard of SMART goals. Here's what SMART goals mean. Uh, specific, measurable, attainable. Oh, y'all know you're talking about out here. I, I got some smart folk out here. Specific, measurable, achievable or attainable relevant or timely. Okay, let me break it down. I want, I want everyone to be on the same page. Um, so so, so let, me, let me show you this. Um, he, he, here, is, here is what a SMART goal is not. I want to lose weight. That is not a SMART goal. It's nice, but it's not a SMART goal. Here's, here's your SMART goal. Um, I want to lose 10 pounds or 10 stone through exercising three times a week and only eating mandazi on a weekend. <laughs> That's a smart goal. The a smart goal. I, I want to save a um, hundred thousand shillings. That's not a smart goal. Here's your smart goal. I want to save a hundred thousand shillings by saving ten thousand shillings over ten months. That's a smart goal. So here it is. The, 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 the Abraham, uh, Eleazar's goal was smart. It was specific because he had a clear and specific task to go find a wife for Isaac. It was measurable because he set up a way to measure the success of his goal, asking that the woman who offers water to him and his camels be the one who was chosen by God. It was achievable because while the task was challenging, because he took 10 camels and because he took 10 gifts, he had the resources to make the goal happen. It was relevant. Here's why it was relevant. Because God says to Abraham, I am going to give you a great lineage. He can't get a great lineage if his son doesn't have any children. So it was relevant. And it was time bound because he, it was time bound because he understood that he was operating within a practical time constraint. He did not delay. He did not go hang out at his homeboy's house. He went straight to do what his master told him to do. All I'm trying to tell you is success doesn't just happen. You have to be strategic in that thing. But understand that strategic strategy will not get you there alone. You need God's grace and you need God's guidance to get you there. Do I have a witness here? 
Goals and vision boards are great, but strategy is the journey you'll take to get you there. And so once he has the strategy in place, he begins to look for signs and signals. I'm almost through. E e Eleazar is looking for a woman who demonstrates extraordinary kindness and generosity. Uh, you, 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 you cannot, li listen to this, you, you cannot ask God for a sign and then not look for the sign. Some of us ask God for stuff and then we close our eyes. Or we ask God for a sign and we think God is going to send the sign in the way we think God is going to send the sign. But can I tell you something? God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And, and any child of God should understand the importance of revelation. There are things you need to keep your eyes open to. So to get the balance between prayerful waiting and appropriate action, you've got to look for signs and signals. And once you pay attention to signs and signals, here's the final move. Once you pay attention to signs and signals, you will have a successful outcome. Someone shout, successful outcome. So Eleazar, Eleazar prays. He relies on prayer, not prayer to check a box, but he believes that prayer is what he needs in order to make it work. And Pastor Akali, here's what I love about this text. After he prays, as soon as he finished praying, as soon as he finished asking God to give him success today, he opens his eyes and he sees Rebecca. He sees beautiful Rebecca. And he sees Rebecca carrying a load on her shoulders. It means you never know who's watching you carry what you carry. You, you never know who is observing you. And so whatever you carry, you ought to carry it with class. You ought to carry it with dignity. You ought to carry it with grace. You never know who is watching you. And here's what blows my mind. She does exactly what Eleazar prays for. She gives him water. Then she says, I'll give your camel some water too until they've had enough. Can I tell you something? There's a part you must play in your own success. And so, and so he realizes that Rebecca is the one who has been chosen. And when she consents to be married to this young man, here's what Eleazar does. See, right there in the text. The Bible says that Eleazar gives God the glory. No, y'all missed it. He asked God to make him successful today. He prays a prayer of success. And when he gets the answer, when he gets the result, he does not forget who brought his success. The Bible says he gives God the glory. When you let God order your steps, when you let God order your decisions, when you let God bring the right people into your life, when you humbly pray for God to give you success, success shall be yours. Do I have a witness here? Through when I tell you this, I was, I was uh, two weeks ago, I was, in, um, I was in Athens, Greece, and uh, I was headed back. Uh, I wasn't headed to my church. I was headed to preach in Toronto, Canada, and I had to transfer through Paris, France, Charles de Gaulle Airport, and, and we were sat on the plane. I was ready to go and ready to get into Toronto that evening, and uh, they, I was sat on the plane for about an hour, and finally they come over and tell us there's a mechanical issue with the plane, and this flight is canceled. Now, I'm mad because i got to get to Toronto, and the plane is canceled, and it's now about 6 p.m. There's no other flight going to Toronto, and so I said, Lord, what am I going to do? Uh, well, 
I asked the Lord, what am I going to do? But the flight folk told me the only thing I can do is go to a hotel and they'll fly me out in the morning. Can I tell you something, New Life? I was mad, 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 mad. I felt like cursing somebody out, but I said, I can't curse somebody out on my way to preach the gospel. Come on and say amen. And so, and so there I am. I, 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 I decided just to stay in the, they gave me a hotel, but I said, no, I don't feel like going to a hotel. It was the Olympics, so I knew all the nice hotels were booked out, and they were putting us in some raggedy hotel. I didn't really want to stay in a raggedy hotel, and so I, I just decided I'm going to sit at the airport, and I'm just going to pray the Lord's going to work this thing out. Well, the Lord did not work it out in the way I wanted him to work it out. I did not make it to Toronto, and so I decided that I must go now to the next place that I was supposed to go instead of going to Toronto. So I got to the place I was supposed to go after Toronto without going to Toronto, but here's the problem. My bags went to another destination. So now I'm mad that I missed where I was supposed to go, and now I'm even madder that my bags are going to another destination. I, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to let them know, hey, I fly with y'all all the time. Uh, I, I'm a value, value customer of this airline. I was trying to be really nice about it, but they said there's nothing they could do. My bags were in one city. I was in another city. What am I going to do? And I'm mad. I'm getting on the plane. I'm getting on my connection flight, and I'm mad. In my, in my spirit, I'm angry, because now i got to go out and buy clothes. Now i got to go out and buy some shoes. i got to go out and buy some underwear, because I have no clothes with me they're all in my check luggage and 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 as i'm as i'm getting ready to uh to to purchase some stuff because i don't have my luggage there's a lady at in a certain predicament i won't let you know what she was going through but she's in a certain predicament and uh, she looks around to see if anybody will help her and, and she looks at me, uh, she, she's a white lady, and uh, she looked at me and looked away from me because perhaps she didn't think that a black man was going to help her. Uh, and so I decided to help her in her predicament, and she was so grateful that I helped her in that predicament. Can I tell you something? If I never missed my, if I never, if the flight had never been canceled, if, if I never, if I never had my luggage in another city, I would not have been on the, in the place where I was going to be to help her. Can I tell you, sometimes God will detour you. Sometimes God will divert you to be a blessing to someone else. And can I tell you something? You ought to serve the Lord gladly. You ought to ask for success even when you help other people. Because there could have been someone else that was going to help her. Her. There could have been someone else that was going to, going to support her in her time of need, but I've lived long enough to know that serving other people isn't about what other people get out of it, but serving other people is about what God is doing in you. Do I have a witness here? And so Eleazar prayed the prayer of success, not for him but for somebody else. And this reminds us that intercession on behalf of somebody else is our Christian duty. You, when you pray to God, don't be selfish with your prayers. Learn how to pray for other people. Learn how to intercede for other people. And when you learn how to pray for other people, watch God work out your stuff while he's using you to help work out other people's stuff. God desires of us to be successful. And, and, and I, and I want to encourage you to incorporate the prayer of success in your prayer life. Don't, 
don't, don't just accept things for how they are. God has called us to be resilient. God has called us to be fighters. God has called us to be disciplined. God wants you to be successful at school. God wants you to be successful on your job. God wants you to be a successful father or a successful mother, a successful husband or a successful wife. God wants you to be a successful musician. But understand, you will never get to any significant level of success if God knows that he cannot trust you with success. You will never get to any significant level of success if God knows that when you arrive there, you won't even give him the glory. You will never achieve any significant level of success if God knows that when you get there, you won't even have time to pray. Serve other people and give God the glory and watch God do for your life what you cannot do for yourself. And all of God's people set together. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we pray. Tis the blessed hour of prayer when our hearts slowly bend as we gather to Jesus our Savior and free. If we come to Him, if we come to Him in faith, trusting Him, trust to protection to share. What a bomb! What a bomb for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be that blessed hour, blessed hour of prayer, blessed hour. Number two, tis the blessed hour of prayer. When the Savior draws near, with a tender compassion, his children to hear. Blessed hour of prayer. Blessed hour. Blessed hour. Oh, what a bomb for the weary. What a bomb for the weary. Oh, how sweet. Come on, tis the blessed hour of prayer. Tis the blessed hour. When the tempted and tried to 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 the Savior who loves them, who loves their souls confide. Blessed are, oh prayer, blessed are, blessed are, what a bomb for the weary, what a bomb for the weary, oh how sweet, 
Oh, how sweet. Come on, last verse. Here's my favorite verse. Tis the blessed hour of prayer. Trusting him. Here's my favorite line. That the blessing we are needing will surely receive. Blessed hour, blessed hour of prayer, blessed hour of prayer, what about for the weary, oh how sweet to be there. Listen on today. That's on today, you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. At the earlier service, five, six people said they wanted to give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is prompting me to ask, even again, if there's someone here who says, Pastor, I need to be baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. Your relationship with Jesus is the only way that success is guaranteed. And perhaps on today, you're saying, I want to make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you fit into that category, do me a favor, slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. On today you're saying, I want to be baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. I've never been baptized before, or perhaps I want to rededicate my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Slip your hand up, because I want to pray for you. I want you to know that success can be yours, but it starts when you make a decision to do what God has told you to do. True success is being in the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you fit into that category, you want to be baptized in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit, slip your hand up, I want to pray for you. And perhaps you're watching online. Perhaps you said you didn't want to come to the sanctuary today, but you're watching online. Do me a favor, just type in the chat. Type in the chat. Make a comment. I want to be baptized. Leave your email address or your number. Someone will be in touch with you. Because we realize preaching is never the destination. Preaching just points to the destination. And that destination is Jesus, who is the Christ. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. As together we pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you afresh for the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ. We thank you for life and life more abundantly. We thank you for joy unspeakable and full of glory. God, fill us with a prayer life, reminding us that in the fullness of your trust, we can lose every care. God, we are being called to have a deeper prayer life. We are being called to have a bold prayer life that asks you for success this day. For we know that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Then, Lord, you said you would hear from heaven. You would heal our sin. You would, heal our, you would forgive our sin. And you would heal our land. We pray these things in the name of Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said together, Amen. Amen.